Hi there. For today's video, I thought we'd do something a little bit different and talk about some techniques of modern jazz composition. I thought an interesting way to do this would be to take a look at one of my own compositions, and then I can talk about some of the considerations and techniques I used in writing this piece. This is my composition, A Gathering Storm. What we'll do first is we'll take a listen to it while studying the score, and then I will talk about some of the techniques I used in writing this piece. I hope you enjoy. Before we get started talking about this piece, I just want to say, if you like what you heard, you can find the complete recording along with solos right here. Also, if you are interested in getting the study score, it is available on my website for free. You can also purchase the parts for a small fee. Uh, those links are in the description below. Thanks. To start with, this piece begins with a repeating piano ostinato that goes like this. If you take a look at that ostinato, uh, especially the top four notes of it, you'll notice that we have A, B flat, C, and F, which looks something like an F major triad in first inversion with an added 11. Uh, this is a voicing I like a lot because it has a little bit of a rub, but a really interesting color. Something I like to do when I find a voicing I like is consider the way that it interacts with different roots. So for instance, in this composition, it's placed over G and makes a G minor 11 type of sound. But if I were to place it over B flat, all of a sudden this is a B flat major seven sus two voicing. If I place it over D, I get kind of an Aeolian sound, but uh, you could also think of this as a B flat major nine chord over its third. Or if I place it over D flat, I get a really interesting kind of melodic minor sound where I get, uh, I guess this would be a D flat major seven sharp five 13 type of voicing. Thinking about how a voicing interacts with different roots has allowed me to kind of open up my color palette and think about these chords a little bit differently. When I was writing the horn melodies for this particular composition, I wanted to create an effect where they interwove themselves with the piano ostinato part. Something you might notice is if you look at the trumpet and tenor saxophone melodies here, uh, that they form neat harmonic shapes with the piano ostinato. Something else that I was trying to consider was the use of contrary motion between the trumpet and tenor saxophone. <clears throat> In classical composition and theory, uh, contrary motion is incredibly important in order to ensure that two voices or more sound like individual voices rather than as a part of a moving shape. For this next section, I used one of my favorite 
techniques in jazz composition, which is stepwise bass motion. Uh, in this case, ascending stepwise bass, mo bass motion in order to create kind of a building effect. What you'll notice is I'm moving my way up through all of that using entirely G Dorian. And then here to create some more color, I start moving up in B flat Dorian. until we finally resolve to this F minor 13 chord, which kind of represents a bit of a breakdown in the band at that moment. You'll notice in this section that the rhythm section has completely dropped out, leaving the horns to be the sole source of harmonic and melodic information. I did this in order to create a sense of drama as well as to contrast from the earlier sections with this driving piano ostinato that fills up every single beat in this 6-8 groove, um, adding a little bit more space and allowing us to explore a little bit of a different texture. Uh, I really suggest that all composers really consider different instrumentations that they can use within their full band. Uh, it's a great way to find different textures and colors that you might not otherwise if you're always using your full instrumentation. At this moment, while the horns are playing their melody, I allow the bass to come back in, but now playing a more rhythmicized figure that's a little bit more interesting than its previous long note figure. I then have the full band come back in on this interesting set of voicings that are based on stacked fourths up top. that then have a contra uh, contrary motion bass line moving down below. That leads us back into our original melody and ostinato. In this iteration of the melody, I now thickened out the instrumentation by adding in the alto saxophone to the horn section and doubling the trumpet melody in the guitar. Uh, the bass continues to play a similar, more rhythmicized pattern that we introduced earlier. <laughs> So now we come to the last section of this composition, um, and again, we are doing this ascending motion bass line with the arpeggiated chords in the rhythm section. But what I've chosen to do this time is actually double this arpeggio in the horn section, and I've chosen to double it using one of my favorite arranging techniques. Um, rather than trying to double this entire arpeggio in my horn section, each member of the horn section just takes a small section of it, with them dovetailing, connecting at one note. This creates an interesting cascading effect, um, and then the dovetailing makes it sound a little bit smoother, uh, but also makes it a little bit easier to perform, uh, as this can actually be a little bit of a hard technique to pull off in performance. Uh, this was definitely the most of the rehearsal for this piece was probably working on this specific section with the horns. <laughs> You'll notice in this section of the melody that I extended this ascending bass line motion an extra four measures. This is to add a little bit of extra tension to the piece. And then you'll notice on these chords, these sting chords, that I intentionally placed a minor ninth between two of the voices 
the G flat on top and the F natural down an octave from that. The minor ninth is an incredibly dissonant interval. Uh, I, for my ears, it has a very similar sound to a half step. That's because it contains the same notes. Um, something I always found really interesting to me was that the minor ninth has a lot more dissonance in it than a major seventh, even though they contain the same notes, just inverted. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope it explains some things about the way that I think about composition and gives you some inspiration for using some of these techniques in your own compositions. If you're interested in checking out the study score for this piece, that is available for free on my website, or you can also purchase the individual parts if you're interested in this piece for performance purposes. Um, I also want to mention, if you like the music that you heard, you can find this album, Places Real and Imagined, available on YouTube or Spotify. Um, or if you want to support the music a little bit more directly, you can also purchase a physical or digital copy on my Bandcamp page. That link is also in the description below. Thank you very much and happy practicing.